Hello, thank you all for joining us here at the end of the day for our final session, which is the conservation career panel. We have four um, wonderful professionals. Hello, thank you all for joining us. There we go. Okay, we have uh, four wonderful professionals here from throughout the watershed in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And these individuals each work in a different sector of the industry, state agency, nonprofit, federal agency, and private. And so first today, we will hear from Melissa Rodriguez, who is a Minnesota Green Corps member with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's Get the Let Out program. Then we will hear from Nikki Hanger, who is the Forestry Program Coordinator with the St. Croix River Association. Following that, we will hear from Marion Schaefer, Aquatic Biologist with the National Park Service at the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. And finally, we will hear from Tony Haverneck, who is the Senior Ecologist with WSB and Associates. And after all four panelists have had a chance to share who they are, what they do, we will have time for some Q&A. So like you've been doing all day, we encourage you to put your questions and answers and your comments into the chat. And we will start by asking those at the end of um, during the Q&A. So um, I am going to hand it over to our first panelist, Melissa Rodriguez. And to do to be here, I'm Melissa and I am currently a Green Corps member with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's Get the Let Out program. So I'll quickly go through my early career path, what is Green Corps and what I currently do for GTLO. Uh, next slide. So I have a bachelor's in fisheries, wildlife conservation biology from the University of Minnesota. And while I was in school, I looked for various ways to gain experience within the environmental field. So I'll just quickly give a rundown on a few experiences that I did. I was a field technician for a grad student's project where I surveyed hunters around Minnesota. I did two internships with Spark Y here in Minneapolis, where I created educational kits for their DIY STEM lab, and I also helped um, create a demonstration model for a watershed. I studied abroad and did a behavioral study on a species of birds. And lastly, I was a lab technician for an entomology lab where we studied parasitism between flies and finches. So those are just a few things that I did in undergrad, but after school, I really wanted to experience the field tech life of doing seasonal jobs, traveling and working with wildlife hands-on. So my first field tech job after school was monitoring breeding piping plovers and lease terns in North Dakota with the US Geological Survey. So these species are threatened and endangered in North Dakota and their population needed to be monitored. So I spent most of my days out on a boat searching for birds, reciting their bands and monitoring their nest. This was a really fun job, but it was really also eye-opening to understand the precautions that is needed when working with endangered species. Um, next slide. Afterwards, I came back to Minnesota and I did a fall position up in Duluth with Hawk Ridge, where I counted migrating raptors. So this was also an amazing experience as some days you get to witness over 10,000 raptors fly by and the community up there is really great. So if you haven't had a chance to go up there during the spring or fall migration, I really recommend that. Um, I also helped with their banding efforts as, oops, as you can see me holding a northern goshawk and solid owl. But for 2020, I had my next field season lined up with the Minnesota DNR except due to the pandemic, it was canceled. So my next environmental related position was applying for Green Corps. And Minnesota Green Corps is an AmeriCorps position that's founded by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, MPCA. So this program is 11 months long and it allows you to serve at a governmental agency, nonprofit or educational institute to work on projects that preserve and protect Minnesota's environment. So we have about 40 members and everyone does something different, but it's separated into four main groups of community outreach, air pollution reduction, green infrastructure, and waste management. So that leads me to what I'm doing today. So I'm serving with uh, the state. So the MPCA's Get the Let Out program. And Get the Let Out is an outreach program that encourages anglers to use lead-free fishing tackle to protect our state bird, the common loon. So a brief overview on the issue. One of the leading causes of death for loons is lead poisoning. And one way that they get poisoned is by swallowing lead fishing tackle as the majority of tackle is still made out of this toxic material. So we're trying to bring awareness to this issue and telling people that this is happening and that the solution is easy and preventable. 
So we encourage people to fish, but we want them to use lead-free tackle like tungsten, tin, bismuth, et cetera, to prevent loon deaths. And since we are an outreach program, we would be traveling, doing in-person events, talks, presentations, but we've had to put that on a hold due to the pandemic. So I've been completely virtual and have only seen my team once in person. So I've only done two in-person events as well due to the agency having really strict safety guidelines. So what am I doing? Um, I'd say that we've been doing a lot of learning, planning, adapting, and updating resources. We're building connections with partners, growing a presence on social media, and creating kits that will be useful if we can't be there in person so that people can use them just due to the uncertainty of COVID. And lastly, we've been doing virtual outreach like today for groups and classrooms that go more in depth on our program. A pro about being with the state is that we do have a lot of resources available to us for updating our fact sheet and web page. We have a team of people that is dedicated to work on that. Or if we need help in an area with um, something that we don't have experience with, we can easily get connected with someone who does within the agency or other state agencies or outside of it as well. A downside though, is that things can take a while and need to be, re need to be reviewed. So you have to go through like a hierarchy of people to get things, um, get a task approved. So that can really slow down um, the process and progress of a project. But overall, I would say I've had a positive experience and you slowly learn how things work within the agency and adapt and prepare when coming up with new ideas. I will mention that having funding or budget or a budget really helps for our program. It allows us to buy materials for outreach gives us a chance for travel, and it allows you to um, get contractors outside of the agency if you want things to be done. So money is definitely a big pro. Um, and to end this off, I would say that my advice for students is that you diversify your skill sets and take on new opportunities and think on um, gaining, I think that gaining any type of experience is beneficial as it allows you to get closer to a position that you wanna do but it also makes you a more well-rounded person and it allows you to explore your options and interests along the way, which can help you understand what you truly want to do. All right, <laughs> thank you everyone. Thank you, Melissa, that was really great. Um, thank you for sharing your experience. And next up, we will have Nikki Hanger, who, here she is. So, there we go. So, Awesome. Um, can you see? I think I'm sharing. Yep, there we go. I'm Nikki and I work with Nicole at the St. Croix River Association. Um, I just wanted to share this uh, one slide to kind of go through the different pathways that took me to where I am now. And I just want to highlight that sometimes the conservation world isn't a straight shot, right? Like there's a bunch of um, paths that you can go to and it's just a very broad, um, it's a very broad thing. So I've done a lot of different different things. So I graduated in 2010, which is 11 years ago. It feels just like yesterday though. Um, I decided to go to the University of Dayton, which is very close to where I grew up. And so I went, I got a degree in environmental biology. Um, while I was in undergrad, I thought I was going to do forensic entomology. So I have a picture of the, uh, a blow fly. Um, while also going to school, I joined sustainability club. You know, I also worked in the cafeteria. Um, so not necessarily related to conservation, but all those experiences were really helpful, like uh, Melissa mentioned in her presentation. Um, after graduating undergrad, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I decided to go a little bit further and went to New York, uh, Syracuse, New York, to get my graduate degree. And I went to SUNY ESF, which stands for State University of New York Environmental Science and Forestry School. So it's one of the longest names. Um, so I got my uh, master's of science there um, in forestry and natural resources management. And I coupled that with an MPA degree, which essentially is the master's of public administration. And it just helps you get into the nonprofit world and also the government world. It was a two for one degree. So I said, why not? And I uh, went for it. Uh, the green beetle in, that presentation, in my presentation is um, emerald ash borer. Um, so it's an invasive species, and I know some of you guys learned about invasive species in Jeopardy. Um, so it's a tiny green beetle, 
that um, girdles trees and can kill, kill ash trees. And so that was my thesis. Um, but after graduating uh, from New York, I decided to go back to Ohio um, where I'm from and I kind of worked a few odd jobs here and there. Um, I didn't get a full-time job immediately, right? So I don't think anyone needs to feel bad about not being able to get a job right off the bat. So, you know, I worked at Forever 21, I uh, served. I also worked at a boathouse at a local park and I really loved that. You could just be outside all day uh, helping people on and off um, boats. So that was really fun. Um, I also worked part-time at Taking Root, which is a nonprofit that helps uh, the community plant trees. Their goal was to plant 2 million trees by 2020. Um, I left before they reached that goal, but I'm sure they're doing great still. Um, and then after doing those uh, kind of odd jobs for a few years, I got my first full-time job at the EPA, um, Environmental Protection Agency. I worked as a communication specialist where I helped um, scientists translate their language to easy to understand things. So we did webinars, websites, educational events, but this was more based on drinking water. So it wasn't necessarily related to my degree. Um, and I really wanted to get back into the forestry world, which is kind of where my path takes me now. Um, I have that little curve um, after the EPA because we got furloughed, we got, you know, we got shut down. So I worked as a server again. Um, but after uh, two years at the EPA, I decided to get back into the forestry world. Um, I started applying to a lot of different jobs with forestry program coordinator title, and I interviewed for uh, SCRA uh, for the forestry program coordinator position, and I got it. I've never been to Wisconsin or Minnesota, but here I am, and I really love it. Um, the first day of work was great, you know, driving up the St. Croix, um, seeing all those beautiful, seeing the beautiful rivers and I really enjoy my job. So right now I do a lot of work with landowners. Uh, so I do communications and outreach. I help woodland owners connect to resources and programs to help manage their woods. Um, I know some of you guys saw that watershed map. A lot of the watershed is actually really forested um, and we wanna keep it that way. Uh, and there's a lot of private landowners in the area. So helping them helps keep the forest, forest forested and then also clean water. So that's kind of what I do now. Um, and then as for advice on my career path, I feel like networking has been really, really important. Um, so keep in contact with people. You know, I know people mentioned following groups on Facebook, Instagram, um, social media, and then send that email. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. You know, people are usually trying to help. So yeah, that's a little bit about what I do. Thank you, Nikki. That was really wonderful. Um, story about your experience and walking through that slide was really helpful. So up next we have Marion Schaefer. Uh, Marion, if you have something to share, you can go ahead and share your screen and turn your video on. Here we go. Okay. Oh, it's not letting me share. There we go. Okay, is this working for everyone? I see it, it looks good. Okay. Okay, so um, my name is Marion Schaefer. I am, as, um, as Nicole mentioned before, I'm the aquatic biologist for the St. Curry National Scenic Riverway. I do a whole plethora of things for the riverway, everything from water quality monitoring to invertebrate sampling to native and endangered species and also aquatic invasive species. Um, I just joined the riverway actually relatively, um, I've only been there for a relatively short period of time compared to some others in my office. I joined last June amidst COVID. So it's been an interesting journey um, trying to navigate the pandemic and, um, and, and sliding into this new role, but I've learned a ton and I learn more every single day and I'm, I'm absolutely loving it here. Um, it feels like home. Um, I'm from the east side of the state and now uh, moving to the west side was a little bit <laughs> daunting and my family uh, was fearful that I would become a Vikings fan, but I am still uh, a proud Green Bay Packers fan. But um, I'm loving the St. Croix watershed and living, working and playing on it. And um, I, I just could not go on and on enough about how much I love it here. Um, so like the others had mentioned, their, all, their experiences were not straight paths and just like them, gosh, mine has been 
quite the wandering journey. Um, I have gone all over the globe to gain experience. Um, us biologists are very curious creatures. Well, all humans are, right? That's just how we are innately. And um, especially as a scientist, we just want to know everything and how it works. And so um, since I was little, I've been wanting to, to experience the world and other cultures, other cultures and environments. And um, so that's kind of how um, my path has been so far. So um, let's see. If, well, let me go to the next slide. There we go. So here I am born and raised in uh, Wisconsin. Beautiful shores of Lake Michigan is where I grew up. Um, I went to college in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, and then I took an internship over in Taiwan. And uh, the, the next slides will show some more pictures and more details on, on these experiences abroad. Um, and then my path after I graduated with my bachelor's took me down to Panama, Central America, where I did some marine, uh, aquatic marine work and, and fell more in love with the aquatic side of things. Um, then I went up to Alaska to experience to experience the mountain life and I uh, worked in a national park up there called Denali National Park. And then lastly, here I am back home where um, I plan to stay for a while or for the long haul, actually, I should say. Um, so, so yeah, I, I did all of my degrees actually at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. That's just how my, uh, my, my path worked out. A lot of people go far from home, but I, I, I wanted to stay home uh, near my family for, for reasons. And um, I originally was actually studying human biology. Um, I took one course, um, an ecology course, and fell in love realizing that I could do science outside. And so I walked into um, the administrative office that day and changed my major. Um, so I took it step by step. Everybody's path is different, but I started with my associate's degree, then moved on to my bachelor's of science, and then finally my master's. Um, and I focused on fisheries throughout this, this period of time, specifically larval fish populations on uh, Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes as a whole. Um, I took my time. Uh, don't ever feel or compare yourself to others and feel like for instance, I took eight years to get through college. I worked full time, I had to support myself. Um, and so it took long, I couldn't do uh, you know 15 credits a semester. I, I, I took a little bit less so I could work full time and balance my life. Uh, everybody does it different. Um, I was really passionate, as I said, about trying to gain experience abroad. And so I took advantage of those opportunities along the way and I encourage you to as well. Um, I have a lot of pictures that just kind of sums up my journey. So I'll just kind of try to go through these quickly as I don't have a ton of time. So my experience in Taiwan was uh, amazing. I did a community development internship there where I helped farm peanuts and pineapple in, a, in an Aboriginal community um, in the mountains. I helped teach English and, and this was my first uh, kind of cultural experience and I um, just fell in love with this community. Um, this is where I kind of honed in further on, wow, I love ecology. I love studying. I love science, but I loved, I, I noticed I especially love science outdoors. And so I got to experience um, a lot of different species that only exist on that island. And it just was very eye opening. So I came back home, graduated with my bachelor's a couple semesters later, and then I took an experience down in Panama, Central America with the federal government, actually the Smithsonian, and I researched a um, a declining population of marine uh, snail species called the Indian fighting conch. Um, and that is where I fell in love with the underwater world and scuba diving and snorkeling and, and studying the critters that live down below. Um, and, that, and you'll see later that that's part of my job now. So it all came full circle uh, just to go on. So then, as I said, I got my first experience working for the National Park Service up in Alaska in Denali National Park. Um, Alaska, gosh, the pictures do speak all the words right there. So um, beautiful, beautiful state of ours. And um, yeah, I that's how I got in with the National Park Service. And, and it really just felt like my agency. So when I came back home, um, luckily there was an opportunity open here at the Riverway. And man, it, it just, it's everything I've always dreamt of in a, in a, in a profession and a job. And so I applied and I'm so blessed that I, I, I got it. And so here's a little bit about what I do. I'll just go through the next few slides talking specifically about what I do as an aquatic biologist. So um, I'm not just passionate about fish or the critters in the water. I am passionate about everything and caring for everything. And the ecosystem works as a whole, right? Everything depends upon each other. Everything from the landscape to the water to the little 
microbiota that live in the water to the larger to the larger creatures. And so I I wanted a position where I care for every little thing. That's kind of how this role is, and I it's very unique. We do a lot. So um, the the Saint Croix watershed is almost seventy eight hundred um, square square miles, and so it's a large large watershed. And so we need to work with we need to collaborate with partners and work with other agencies to get the, the bulk of the work done. And um, aquatic invasive species, here are some pictures um, of aquatic invasive species that we work on together. Um, SCRA and the National Park Service work together a lot. They're our, our, our main friends group and we combat everything from Pictured on the left is yellow iris and purple loosestrife. And then on the right, um, Asian carp are on the forefront um, as many of you probably know, and then zebra mussels, which are harming our native mussel populations. Um, we work together on all of these efforts throughout the, the field season. Um, zebra mussels are a, a big one, and they are um, currently, uh, we have been monitoring them since 2004, and currently their populations are increasing. And so this is one that we are, are putting a lot of effort and focus on to understand better and how we can uh, mitigate the impacts of this species. Um, we also do native mussel surveys, and as you guys know, the St. Croix watershed is very unique in that it still has 41 native mussel species that have been around since Euro the European settlement. And so it is one of our number one objectives um, to study these populations and understand the mechanisms of their populations and um, preserve them for future generations. And like I said before, I was going to add a slide about water quality, but I was just getting a little too um, too much. So um, if you guys have any questions, please uh, reach out to me at my email address listed there. Um, I'm happy to help you guys in, in any advice. Um, as, as both of the other ladies said before, um, getting experience and just working hard and pursuing all of your passions is really how, how, um, how you get to reach your goals and network and, and learn from others and reach out. And so I encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And that was really wonderful. Very exciting photos that you had there. <laughs> um, it's a tough one to follow up, Tony, but I'm sure you got some really interesting for us here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, what the heck? I'm the last one here. <laughs> Everybody before me was awesome. I'm going to do my darnest. I'm not sure it'll be all that great but um and i don't have any cool pictures i could have a bunch if you wanted but i don't have them today um so you're stuck with just listening to me i'm gonna echo a few things that well most everything that the three that presented before me did um but i'll kind of roll through you know where i grew up what i'm doing now my education career path and kind of some of the things that i'm looking at in terms of innovation and sustainability so uh my name is tony Havranic. I currently work for WSB and Associates down in St. Paul, Minnesota. That's where my office is, but I do a lot of work out of my home in Osceola. So I live over um, by Lotus Lake, on Lotus Lake, over at Trollhagen. Um, I grew up in Bruce, Wisconsin, about an hour and 15 minutes straight east on Highway 8. So I didn't have to go far from home. I was kind of jealous of Marianne's uh, cool world tour map and some of the other folks, but I pretty much, I was educated and worked and learned and still work in uh, Northwest Wisconsin and Eastern Minnesota. Um, I attended University of Wisconsin River Falls, uh, have a broad area agriculture, um, Bachelor of Science with an emphasis in natural resources management and a minor in land use planning and geographic information systems. So basically what I'm saying with that mouthful of a degree is I went with a jack of all trades and not a master of any. I tried to learn a little bit about everything just because I was passionate and interested in just about everything natural resources. Um, so that was everything from fisheries, wildlife, geology, oceanography, um, to environmental policy and um, agricultural economics. I, I heard, I think it was Melissa talking about budgets and grants and funding. And unfortunately that is, a critical piece, understanding um, budgets and how things are funded and be able to access that funding is a critical piece of, you know, moving your passions and your projects forward. So um, even though my degree is really diverse, it served me over the years. Um, I was super fortunate. I got a chance to work 
uh, a full-time job right as soon as I graduated. So I just have a bachelor's degree, no master's. College was super fun. Um, I remember those days fondly. Mm, some of it's because of the education. Others, a lot of it's because of the friends that I made. And some of the things I did in my um, internships and whatnot, you know, outside of the academic realm. Um, so I got hired full time by the St. Croix Chippewa up in Hurdle, Webster, Wisconsin. I uh, started my career as a fish and wildlife technician for the tribe and GIS specialist. And um, basically most of my work revolved around monitoring and restoring wild rice beds in um, Polk, uh, Burnett and Barron County. Um, and then monitoring uh, walleye populations across the entire ceded territory of Wisconsin, northern Michigan, and northern Minnesota. Um, so I got to see a ton of fish, handled more fish in those seven years than um, most anybody would handle in three lifetimes. But it was really neat to see the diversity of species and the diversity of size uh, of the fish that we were handling. Um, seven years into that career, or seven years into that position, I was promoted to the land and water resources manager position. So just like more of a management role, developing work plans to monitor um, the water bodies, rivers, streams, wetlands, lakes that the tribal members used and lived on. Um, just trying to help communicate or first understand what the water quality was. And when I talk about water quality, I mean chemical, physical, and biological. And then um, I think Nikki was talking about being able to communicate some of that technical data to tribal members, tribal council, and then partners, right? A big part of it was going outside of the, the place that I worked in, the tribe, and work collaboratively with other people that have a vested interest in, in accomplishing the goals of resource management and restoration, right? So Park Service is one of those partners over the years. Um, lake associations, other tribes, other federal government agencies, a lot of our funding at the tribe came through uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency, Region 5 out of Chicago. Um, so it was great. It was an incredibly fun job. I got a chance to move more into policy towards the end of my job there. And then in 2014, I took the position that I have now, which is a senior ecologist with WSB down in the cities, working um, as a private consultant for a lot of the folks that I got to work with as uh, an employee at the tribe, right? So I was incredibly fortunate enough. We talked a little bit about networking earlier to continue to forge those relationships, keep them and make them stronger. So now I'm working for other tribes, lake associations, counties, cities, federal and state governments, and watershed districts to take the knowledge I have. And really a lot of the work that I do is invasive carp. So both European common carp, and then I saw Marianne had the picture up of the invasive Asian carp species. Um, I'm working on both of those. Uh, in 2019, I started another subsidiary company that focused on um, transporting live rough fish, carp, bullhead, catfish, um, buffalo to human markets out on the East Coast and in Canada. And I've grown that business through some additional acquisitions. And what I'm trying to show, I'm trying to do is show that synergy between the fisheries management side, right? So we go into these lakes and these rivers and these entire watersheds and we say, we figure out how many fish, carp, are in that and how many we need to remove in order to improve water quality in the vegetative community. And then you kind of look at it like a farm. We know how many are there. We know how many we need to take out. Once we take them out, we work with the inland commercial fishing crews, load them on our trucks and we ship them, we ship them out. So we're making use, we're doing, it's a three pronged approach. We make use of an invasive species. We, we feed people and provide jobs and we restore the environment. So that company is Fish2O. It's a subsidiary to WSB. And really what I wanna be doing moving forward is increasing our sustainability approach. And what I mean by that is, Marianne had the picture of the silver carp up there. So we're starting to work with US Geological Survey and a few other folks in developing new and innovative techniques to remove these species from our waterways. The, the, the whole uh, bottleneck on that is the marketability, right? So if you took out a million pounds, what are you gonna do with a million pounds of fish? Sometimes they're just landfill. I, what I want to start working on is how can we use those fish because we're already using other species to feed people. How can we use those pe those fish species to feed people here and in other countries because we know it's a, it's a world problem. So um, really for me, what drives me nowadays is finding new and innovative approaches to common and emerging problems um, in our environment with a real focus on invasive fish species. So 
I've had a chance to do both public or government and private. Um, I think I've got a long ways to go yet. Uh, probably another 15 or 20 years of working. So hopefully I'll get a chance to work with um, maybe some of you folks that are on this event today. And uh, I would just echo what uh, Marianne had said is I'm local and I'm always willing to be you know, helpful and mentor. So if there's opportunities or interest from any of the folks here, I'd be more than willing to um, uh, facilitate that. Thank you, Tony. That was really wonderful. Um, we have about three minutes left. I'm hoping to get our other two panelists back in here. So we'll see if they rejoin here. Um, there we go. We do have quite a few questions in the chat. So I'll just see if we can get one of them answered. And then we'll make sure that, you know, um, if you're okay with sharing your information that, that, you know, anyone can reach out and ask you those questions as well. Let's see here. So one question that is of interest is, I think this one was asked right away for Melissa, but might apply to everyone. Um, what are some of the most unique species that you have found helped or studied? <clears throat> so Melissa, you can answer first if you want to, otherwise everyone else can answer too. Oh yeah, no, I replied to that comment and I said, when I studied abroad, I studied um, long-tailed mannequins, which are these really flashy birds that dance on a, like they just, they do like lecking, which is a flashy breeding behavior. So they were really cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, I don't know this is, if this is very unique, but I used to study blowflies. Uh, one was like Lucilia sericata. And I guess a fun fact between about blowflies is that you can tell the difference between male and female by the females have eyes that are wider apart and the males have eyes touching. But essentially we just studied um, uh, time of how to figure out time of death by using insects. So that was kind of a cool research project. Okay. Do you want to go, Tony, or? Oh, I'm scared. You guys are crushing me. But you go <laughs> and I'll go. Um, I would say uh, the mollusk family, uh, they have the coolest life history ever, I think, out of all creatures. The fact that they need to use um, a native host species and some mollusk species have very specific fish species. They're not just general fish species. They have to, like one fish species they use to reproduce and they, they kind of shoot their, they mimic looking like a baby fish and then they shoot their babies on <laughs> to the gills of the fish, literally. And um, then they, the fish, raise the babies on their gills for a little bit. And then they, when the muscles reach a certain development point, they drop off and then they grow and live their lives from there. It's just really wild, I think. Well, that is, that is pretty wild. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm going simple here. Um, I'm, just gonna do, uh, I'm just gonna talk about wild rice. Like I said, I stayed, I'm, like, stayed in that part of the, of the uh, country in the world. So Northwest Wisconsin, I, you know, I didn't even, I don't think I'd even seen it. I don't even think I'd seen it, even though I grew up in Russ County, or at least knew that I saw it until I worked for the tribe. And actually I may have fudged just a tiny little bit. So I had a little internship after I graduated, which got me into my full-time position. And one little thing I'd say about that is, um, I actually had an internship offer from Wisconsin to to do inland trout down in the Southern part of the state. And I declined it and just crossed my fingers to get the tribal internship because of the uniqueness of it. I didn't know anybody else who had ever done anything like that. So I guess maybe that's another little piece of advice. I'm like, ah, I'm gonna go for it, which I got it, which led to everything else. So the wild race, because of the really deep cultural connection, um, I'm not gonna go into it now, but if you guys get an opportunity, you should really check that out, how the Ojibwe traveled westward and their creation story revolved around rice or monomen. Um, but then once I started working with it and realizing all the habitat benefits, plus the, the wildlife food source and the human food source and how you can feed yourself with that and processing and everything, it's just, it's really cool. So I do, I still wild rice. If anybody wants to learn how to, I'd be willing to take you out too. And we've got plenty of it around there. So, um, yeah, that's, that'd be my speed. Oh, and, um, silver carp are pretty cool too. Even though they're, even though they're invasive. I never handled one until about a year and a half ago. Wow, they're powerful, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, 
yeah, all sorts of fun stuff there. But wild rice and silver carp. Thank you, Tony and Marion and Nikki and Melissa for those great answers. Um, so, I mean, we are at our a little bit past our two o'clock end time here. Um, if anyone wants to stick around, we can stick around and, and maybe answer a couple more questions if you guys have time. Um, but otherwise, um, we really appreciate everyone, all of our wonderful attendees who have been here all day and um, have been asking lots of fabulous questions. Um, our panelists, if you want to share your contact information for people to ask you more questions, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and if anyone in our attendees has questions, you're welcome to reach out to me and I can try to connect you with um, whoever it is that might have the answer. So I will put my information in the chat as well. So thank you all. Um, I think, let's see, panelists, do you wanna do, you wanna do one more question or? Awesome. All right. Well, we'll do one more question then because I see we still have some people watching. So let's do one more and then we'll call it a day. So uh, another question in here is, um, I like this one. How did you find out where you were really meant to be? Hmm. So let's see. I'll pick so we don't have to wait for someone to jump in. Um, Marion, would you like to go? Gosh, that's a tough one. Um, it took me a while, honestly, it took me a while, I think until now, um, which is part of the reason I, I mean, part of the reason I went all over the globe is because I wanted to, like I said, experience other cultures and ecosystems, but also um, I thought I wanted to move to Alaska for good. <laughs> I fell in love with Alaska and I thought I was gonna live, but I didn't realize it wasn't, I wanted to be home and near my family until I was there for a couple of years and I just realized, no, this isn't where I wanna be. And then I came home to Wisconsin and then I found, I don't know if my dream job found me or if I found it, but it, like it just happened. And um, now I'm here and I just know it's where I wanna be for the longest. So just, it's just a feeling. I don't know how to explain it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Somebody else go. <laughs> Thank you, Marion. That does, it does make sense. Okay. It's hard to make sense of where you want to be. I'm glad yes. I'm not the one answering, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think Tony is off of his mute. So let's let's see what Tony thinks. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna throw one thing. I guess I'll throw in there. And I think I think the question was asking how have you found? Uh, how do you know your where you want to be in terms of your career? The one thing I'm gonna go. So I would agree with everything that Marianne just said. But I'm gonna go a little one step further because I realize this more now being in the consulting world. Work life balance is a huge, huge key to overall happiness, right? I think I think it's, I wanna frame it in that way because it's one thing like, okay, like, okay, I like money, right? I think most people like money. So like I could have went a different route and done like finance and business and like went somewhere and just put my head down and done something for, you know, 40 years, 30 years or 40 years to make a ton of money, but holy cow, you know, how crazy would that be? I, I wouldn't be happy, right? So. Finding something I think that you really are passionate about that you love and that when you, when it's Sunday night, you're not dreading Monday morning. Now that's easily said, not easily done. Um, and the money thing, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to minimize it. Right. I mean, I think we all have professional career goals and we also have long-term financial goals. Right. So, getting those two together and realizing maybe like one might be like might outweigh the other initially because you need that experience you know it's kind of like that thing we talk about i'm sure i'm sure the other panelists will kind of laugh a little bit but you know you want to fill out this job application right and get this really cool job put your prior experience well shoot i don't have any right so you need to grab on whatever rope you can early on build up that experience well you're not going to make a ton and you're going to work extra hard hopefully to get that. But once you get there, as an example of what the panelists were showing you and, and they themselves are examples, you can get there. It just takes a little more time and a little more intense. Um, so yeah, I'm just framing it in terms of like, ha happy with your job, have time at home to do the things you really wanna do and be able to make the money that you need to pay your bills and be able to save and retire at some point. Thank you, Tony. All right, um, let's see, Melissa, would you like to answer the question as well? 
Um, sure, yeah. Um, I still feel like I'm really early on in my career path. Um, so initially, I'm just following my first passion of birds. I just really love birds and the environment. So that's what I've been striving for. But I agree that the more, like the older I get, I'm like, okay, financial help or <laughs> I need that balance is really important. Um, and you start to realize like, okay, what you do need, what you don't need. So I think I'm still trying to find it, but I so far have enjoyed my journey of what I've been doing. Thanks, Melissa. And Nikki, if you have yes. any more thoughts on that topic. Yeah, I mean, everyone had really good responses, so I don't have too much to add. But I also, I think it's a state of mind, right? Like nothing is perfect. Um, uh, I think in high school, I thought like, oh, I'm going to get a job and it's perfect and I'm going to do it forever um, was my mindset. But as I went to college and applied to a few different jobs, you know, it's kind of just like, it is definitely more of a mindset, I feel like. And right now I'm happy with what I do. You know, I do have that work-life balance. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoy it. And so happy to be here <laughs> and doing Thank this. You. Mm -hmm. Well, those are all wonderful answers. There's so many more questions, but unfortunately we are over time now. Um, so Nikki, Melissa, Marion, and Tony, I'll put their info in the chat. And we encourage you either in your class or on your own to reach out to them and anyone else from um, Really, really reach out to anyone, you know, it does, you don't even have to know who they are. If you like an organization, you have any interest, reach out and pretty much everyone in our field and in many other job fields love to share information about what they're doing. So don't hesitate to reach out and ask these questions. So thank you all for being on our panel and thank you to everyone who is still with us. Um, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, bye.